ladies and gentlemen. It's a particular pleasure and honor to be invited to give the Rosalind Wilson Memorial Lecture for the year 2018. I didn't know Miss Wilson, but I'm deeply impressed by all that I've read and found out about her. Her friends and admirers say she believed in the beauty of poetry and education and the unique power of both to change society. She also had a deep and abiding connection with India. However, Rosalind Wilson had another quality which I would place on a higher plane. As her close friend Soli Surabji once put it, she was guided by kindness in another's struggle and courage in her own. The older I grow, the more I learn to value those qualities. The truth is that whilst some of us have them, the majority probably don't. I suspect I belong to the latter category. However, there's one small tenuous link that I can lay claim to in an attempt to connect myself to Rosalind Wilson. She was the founder editor of the much-loved children's magazine Target, which was owned by the India Today group. In my early years, I did a little freelance writing for their fortnightly magazine as it then was India Today. And in my later years, I spent three years as an anchor on their English language channel. I'm not sure what Rosalind Wilson would make of Indian television news and the role it's come to play in our lives. In her time, television was a very different animal to the beast it's become. But I instinctively feel that she would share the questions and issues I wish to raise, even if she did not agree with the answers I have to offer. It is in that spirit that I approach the subject I have chosen for this evening, a critique of television news. Today I want to talk about what is perhaps a significant development on the Indian media landscape, as well as its limitations, the explosion of news on television. Just over two decades ago, TV news was a government monopoly. We were all captive audiences of Doordarshan. Today, there are nearly 400 dedicated news channels, while several others have news bulletins in their daily bulletins. And I haven't even included BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, and Channel News Asia, because they would be there regardless of what I call the Indian news miracle. As a result, I would say it's not an exaggeration to claim that news on television is a popular program. Even if the viewership at any one point of time does not suggest that, two other factors almost certainly do. The enthusiasm of broadcasters for news and the willingness of advertisers to support it. One consequence of this is that we are as a nation better informed, or at least we have the potential to be. I accept that it all depends on what you watch, but the very profusion of news and its easy accessibility raise questions we would not have asked before. Some of these questions might seem heretical coming from a television news producer. Others point towards debates and solutions the West has encountered, but which we in India are yet to fully experience. But in either case, they remain questions that need to be asked. Today, I want to raise some of them and then suggest hesitant answers. Let me start by asking what sort of news do we get from television? It's pretty much immediate. We no longer have to wait for tomorrow's papers to find out what's happened today. And in fact, a lot of the time, television shows the news live. Some, in fact, even boast to doing it faster when they get into the position, business of predicting what's happened. News as a result can be visual and highly illustrative. Television shows rather than describes. You feel as if you're there witnessing for yourself. Although I don't wish to exaggerate, in that sense, television news can be truly participatory. But television news has two limitations, and beyond that, an inherent tendency to sensationalize. Let's start with the latter first. The screen shows only what the camera films. In turn, the camera films only what the cameraman focuses upon. This is not merely a subjective choice, although it is that, of course, as well. It is also 
an important technical matter. The camera will film the visual it focuses on, excluding what the lens cannot see on either side of it. You do not get the picture the eye can see, you only get what the lens can fit in. Thus, a succession of close-ups of a fire, or of fallen trees, or of dead bodies, would suggest a succession of close-ups of a massacre, a severe cyclonic destruction, or an enormous blaze. That may be the case, but it's also possible that it may not. Yet in either event, the mind of the viewer will leap to this conclusion. The danger is that in some instances, it could be the wrong one. This is what I call the inherent tendency of television to sensationalize. This is also why the statement, it has to be true because I saw it on the box, is actually misleading, or at least it's based on a fallacious understanding of television itself. But this problem is easily taken care of, either by pulling out and showing white shots that put events in perspective, or by wisely written commentary. The only thing is that when journalists are up against time deadlines, which is more often than not the case, such balancing is often squeezed out. The two limitations of television news are difficult to tackle, and in India, at least, I have seen very little attempt to tackle them. At times, there is even precious little acknowledgement of them. The first limitation is what TV is the fact that TV has problems handling what it cannot show. An anchor's talking head is not easy to follow. Oral information, in other words, information that you absorb through your ears, is the most difficult to comprehend, particularly when it is detailed. And graphics and photographs don't always help. This is why news bulletins occasionally ignore what they cannot film. In a Western democracy where the reach of television cameras is enormous, this has minimal impact. In India, where the reach of television cameras is a lot less, the impact can be enormous. This is why there is so much more news in the papers than there is in television. Until social media came to our rescue, we could hear or read about lynchings, but we never or only very rarely got to see them. Not so long ago, when the Atil, sorry, not so long ago when the Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad would ban jeans in Lucknow colleges, it would be an item in a newspaper, but rarely a story on television. And the reason is simple, because there was nothing to show. More importantly, this is also why the budget is so boring on television. First, it's just a speech, but then there's the question, what is the speech about? And that, in a sense, is an even bigger problem. Because what it's about is not the price of commodities, or even the tax on the price of commodities, but the change in the tax on the price of commodities, and sometimes the percentage change in that tax. None of this is easy to visualize, so instead we get shown potatoes and tomatoes. No wonder those who follow the budget on TV usually doze off. The second limitation of television news is more serious. It has, to quote a phrase made famous in Britain by John Burt in the 1970s, he did this at the time when he was director of London Weekend Television, he then went on to become director general of the BBC. TV, he said, has a bias against understanding. Let me explain, and to do so, I'll use a contentious Desi example. When television tells you about a gruesome event like the murder of Graham Staines, it brings home the horror of what happened as no other medium can. It sickens you, it tugs at your emotions, it stabs at your conscience, and all of that is very welcome. But what television does not do is to explain why this happened. I don't mean who did it, how, where, when, and at what time, those facts are easily communicated. I mean, why? How could followers of one of the world's most peaceful religions turn upon a single man and his two children? How could we, a people who think of ourselves as tolerant, welcoming, loving, kill so ruthlessly 
and so mercilessly. Those are questions of context, of background, of his judicial commission. No doubt newspapers don't tackle them adequately either, although in the op-ed pages they make an effort to do so. But then papers don't have the same impact when they report such tragedies. Television does. Worse, that impact made by television pushes people towards easy, early, quick conclusions. A rush to judgment follows. Two consequences stand out. We all think we know the truth about Graham Staines' grisly death, and the guilty party often in turn feels hard done by. But the truth is that this understanding is embedded in a context television did not show and did not explore. And therefore, most of us have not found out about that context. And the guilty party may well be guilty, but we have not as yet fully understood why that guilt exists. Let me at this point sum up the essential thing I'm trying to say. Inadequate appreciation of the limitations of television, as well as its inherent tendency to sensationalize, coupled with the fact that news on television is both more frequent and accessible and often has greater impact, leads often inevitably and inexorably <coughs> to unintended distortions or even imperfect understanding. In such circumstances, news and views can become perilously mixed up. And that is often the case when you're watching news, particularly television news in India. Now, so far, I've spoken of problems intrinsic to the nature of television. Alas, in India, we also have a few that are the result of how we use this medium. I shall turn now to faults that lie not in our stars or in the system, but in ourselves. As someone who spent over 35 years in television, I am particularly perturbed by four trends I have repeatedly noticed in the last few years. Now that I've taken a break from television, I feel a moral compunction to speak up. Not to do so would, in a sense, let down the profession I love. First, there's the way anchors choose to interview the Prime Minister. It's done with obvious deference, which leaves little opportunity to challenge, leave aside to cross-question. Instead of focusing on a few well-researched subjects which are then pursued with diligence, each question changes the subject. There's no follow-up. Consequently, a multitude of subjects is raised without any attempt at meaningful pursuit of an issue to its core point. Equally importantly, the Prime Minister is permitted to answer at exorbitant length, often rambling and frequently changing the subject and getting away with it. To be honest, even Donald Trump has never been interviewed in this way. Worse still is what I describe as the character of the questions. Not only are awkward questions and issues avoided, but the questions that are asked are emolliently phrased and gently put. Instead of bringing up his lapses or misjudgments, the Prime Minister is asked to hold forth on the opposition's alleged errors. At no point is he questioned about things that have gone wrong under his charge. The net result is the interview lacks rigor. It feels like an easy ride. And frankly, it's the same whether you watch it on CNN News 18, Times Now, or Z. A second concern is the way anchors behave during television discussions. Those guests who represent viewpoints they agree with are treated gently, permitted to speak frequently, and whatever length they might wish to. But woe betide the guest whose views are contrary to the anchors. He or she is treated like a guilty person in the dock, voices rise, language loses its restraint, and questions are fired relentlessly. The tone is accusatory, and a deliberate attempt is made to shame the person. He or she is frequently interrupted. Indeed, they're given little chance to answer one question before the next is hurled at them. Yet the object of a discussion is to give the audience a chance to hear viewpoints articulated 
by different voices. The aim is to explore artfully and forensically and leave the audience both enriched and able to judge for itself. Where fair and even-handed treatment is required, the anchor instead takes sides and each time he exposes his own prejudices. This process can only diminish him or her. You see this most often on Republic TV in Times Now, but there are younger anchors on other channels who have also fallen prey to this practice, presumably because they think it wins audiences and perhaps easy popularity. My third concern is best reflected by NDTV because it seems to be the only English news channel with a credible primetime evening news broadcast. Frequently after a story, the newsreader feels an urge to tell the viewer what to think of it or how to judge its content. The remarks may be pithy, but they still editorialize. The newspaper equivalent would be a comment by the editor at the end of every front page story telling the reader what to make of it. This breaches the sanctity of news. The viewer sh should be told what's happened, not how to judge or what to make of it. The latter is an intrusion of the news reader's personal viewpoint, which is always unnecessary and frequently possibly unwelcome. Worse, this ends up treating viewers like children. It's therefore also demeaning. Now, NDTV is a channel I respect and have the least complaints about, but this is one that rankles almost every time I watch the news on that channel. And to be honest, I'm surprised the channel's editors have allowed this practice to continue. The grotesquely nationalist hashtags TV channels concoct to push a story or gather a response is my fourth concern. They reek of Ersatz patriotism. They are like drumbeats designed to marshal or dragoon a desired response. They deny you the opportunity to think for yourself. Instead, they seek to corral your thoughts. Worse, they are artless and crude, and they are often a front to intelligence. Let me give you an example of them. Fight for India. Love my flag. Proud Indian. Terror state Pakistan and anti-nation JNU. These are crude attempts to play with our emotions and indeed to infantilize us. They are reprehensible. Finally, the argument that what I've criticized is in fact an illustration of New Age journalism carries no conviction with me. I may be old-fashioned in my approach to journalism, but even if how a story is presented alters with time and technology, its quest for the truth has to be unchanging. No matter how it's delivered, good journalism always stands out. Bad journalism, on the other hand, cannot be disguised, leave aside forgiven, by self-serving excuses about the mood of the people or the atmosphere of our time. And certainly, no attempt to make journalism popular justifies lowering standards of objectivity and fair play. Ultimately, this is more than just about our news channels. Indeed, it goes even further than our democracy. It's about us as people and how we receive the unvarnished truth. If we tolerate half-truths and misrepresentations, we have only ourselves to blame. Most of the people I know believe that the media frequently does just this. Which brings me to the question, how would the greats of Indian journalism, the Frank Morazes, the Girilal Jains, the Prem Bhatias, the George Varghese's, the Kuldeep Nayars, what would they have made of journalism today? Would they applaud their successors in India? Or would they cringe with despair? Would they feel the flower has brightened and blossomed or would they sense that it's starting to shrivel and even rot? The answer, I suspect, lies perhaps in two great changes that have occurred in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which are the decades when Murray's, Jain, Bhatia, Varghese, and Nair were the doyans of journalism. 
First, the reputation the media once enjoyed for reliability, balance and accuracy has seriously suffered. Today, you often hear the put down, just, it's be just because it's in a newspaper or on television doesn't mean it's true. Social media may have spawned fake news, that is undeniable, but the fact people rely on Twitter or WhatsApp to find out what's happened suggests they no longer trust a paper or news channel to tell them the full story or the actual nub and truth of the story. Connected to this is the claim the media could once make of being objective and fair. Few people are prepared to believe that of the media today without double-checking or giving a person a right of reply, and often without knowing the full story, the media judges individuals and finds them at fault. I don't deny there are occasions when we're right, but every time we're wrong, we condemn an innocent person and leave him or her with little opportunity to correct the prejudiced image we've created. The truth is whatever you may make of the promise of Achedin, these are not good times for the Indian media. Most people I know have formed an irrevocable impression that it's become pusillanimous. Where once newspapers and television channels boasted of challenging and exposing the government, we now flinch from doing so. Worse, when our voices are raised, it's against the government's opponents and critics, particularly those who have the gall to question the Prime Minister or the Army Chief. Instead of watchdogs that should growl at the authorities, even if occasionally mistakenly, the media behaves like guard dogs who seek to protect, or pet dogs who just want to be liked. The saddest part of all of this is that it's the electronic media, of which I'm a part, which is widely thought to be the most to blame. Whether it's our interviews of the Prime Minister, where we refuse to challenge and sometimes even to seriously question, or our panel discussions, where volume and heat is deliberately preferred to substance and light, or the crude hashtags we deploy on the screen, which are like drumbeats designed to marshal or tribune a desired response. The net result is we fail to speak truth to power. But it's even worse than that. We end up treating viewers like dumb animals who cannot see through the tricks and will not demand the better of us. We've even reached the stage where the Chief Justice of India in open court has had to admonish the electronic media and, and instead of standing up in our defense, newspaper editorials agreed with him. This is what the Business Standard had to say of Indian news television earlier this year. There is little doubt that the abandonment of fact-checking and of even a pretense to fairness by the electronic media have put into jeopardy not just freedom of speech, but also the smooth working of democracy itself. Yeah. Of course, television as we know it today did not exist when Moray's, Jain, Verghese, Bhatia and Nair presided over Bahadur Shah Zafar In their time, Durdarshan was the plaything of our rulers and rightly reviled. Today, in contrast, we have nearly 400 independent news channels and they, and they might be flabbergasted at the sheer number of them. But if these greats of Indian journalism were to ask a simple question, I wonder how many channels would stand up to that critical test. Is there a channel India can be truly proud of just as the British are justifiably proud of the BBC or the Americans of CNN. I'm not sure what their answer would be. And to be honest, I'm scared to find out yours. But let me share mine. There are some channels I'm proud of some of the time. Some programs I'm proud of most of the time. But there are also a few channels and programs that make me cringe all of the time. Whilst there are newspapers that I would unreservedly applaud, I'm afraid there isn't a single channel I can say that off without biting my tongue because I know I'm fibbing. And yet, this is not the hopeless situation 
I have so far painted it out to be. After all, the media changes every day. Every edition of a newspaper and each bulletin of a news channel is a chance to begin afresh. A new reporter, a different anchor, a better editor, and everything could change very quickly. Perhaps more than any other profession, journalism can draw hope from the fact that tomorrow is another day. So what's the solution? I promised hesitant answers, and hesitantly, I should attempt them. The first lesson I would say is that reportage is not enough. We need more context, more explanation, more background. In turn, that means we need specialist correspondence, more correspondence with dedicated fields to furrow, and fewer firefighters. It also means that for most important developments, television news needs to supplement reports of what's happened with analysis of why and what it means. In other words, news analysis has to become an integral part of news reportage. The second lesson is that we need more current affairs. News on its own is simply not enough. We need programs that go deeper, wider, further. I know that in India, at least in theory, we have these but they clearly fail to serve their purpose, and I include my own programs in that judgment unpreservedly. Such current affairs programs work when they take their subject more seriously than the personalities participating in them. In India, sadly, it's usually the other way around. We need the cold analysis of current affairs. Instead, we have the spectacle and tamasha of clashing viewpoints. We need to shed light, instead we end up generating heat. Finally, television needs the sort of wisdom that comes with age. It has in plenty enthusiasm, dedication, tireless striving, and ceaseless vision. All of that is actually remarkable in an industry so young. Let that not be gainsaid. But television does not have the capacity to reflect, to pronounce wisely, to be sagacious, to speak with gravitas. No doubt such qualities are difficult to acquire, but their absence is telling. Of course, there's a lot more that can and should be done, but my intention this evening is to raise questions, focus attention, and hopefully start a debate. For that purpose, I think I've said enough. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me.